Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is Thursday, August 13th, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, the FBI arrests a pair of ISIS wannabes in Mississippi as the newlywed couple allegedly declared their support for the Islamic State on social media. Then, it's Joe Biggs versus the mainstream media as news reporters in Ferguson confront InfoWars. Why, why carry guns to, to make that point? Um, well, I live in America. We have this thing, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called the Constitution and uh, the Second Amendment. And uh, also you have Missouri state laws which say that you can open carry. And presidential candidate Dr. Ben Carson wants you to know about the true history of Planned Parenthood. One of the reasons that you find most of their uh, clinics in black neighborhoods is uh, so that you can find a way to control that population. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. It was just yesterday that Joe Biggs and myself returned from Ferguson, Missouri. Now we had initially gone out there to document how the city had changed over the past year. Uh, the attitudes of people changing, the physical landscape of the situation changing as well. And we get out there, and Joe Biggs had been in contact with some Oath Keepers, people we've had on our show before, or a group we've had on our show before. And they said, hey, we're going to be out there just like you guys are. Would you guys like if we come and hang out with you and watch your backs? And we said, sure, because just a couple days prior to that, uh, multiple journalists had been attacked and hospitalized. And that's not a knock on the people of Ferguson, Missouri. The majority of the people in Ferguson, Missouri are good, honest people, uh, peaceful people, and they have no ill intentions towards us at all, but there is a violent minority but that you need to uh, defend yourself from. So with that in mind, they said, we'll be there, we'll watch your backs. So we said, great. We get out there to the scene, and instantly the story became about us, about Infowars.com, about the Oath Keepers, because we had guys walking around, uh, watching our backs with long arms, which, hey, somebody wants to walk around and protect me, I don't care what kind of gun they have, but that became the story of the day, which was somewhat surprising to me and to anybody who says, how can you not anticipate that being the story or being as big of a story as it was? Uh, I've been to a conservative 20 open carry marches here in the state of Texas, some large, some small. The largest one I went to, the Alamo, where Alex gave that speech, did not get half the amount of publicity as we got in Ferguson, Missouri, even though there were many more people out there with firearms. And the mainstream media decided to demonize us, also demonize the Oath Keepers for dare brandishing a firearm, or should I say carrying a firearm openly in the public, carrying a long, uh, long rifle. But the issue people forget is last year there were two cases that I know of of people open carrying in this uh, city of Ferguson, Missouri. One in front of Sam's Meat Market, another one in front of a tattoo parlor where people open carried their guns. As far as I know, they didn't shoot anybody. And also, as far as I know, uh, the people who open carried in those situations were not arrested. But when we had people open carrying to watch our backs, they said they were hate mongers, uh, race baiters, uh, Klan members, all type of derogatory things. And then you had the local CBS affiliate come out and say that we were paying these guys. And the reason I realized they were pushing this so hard that we paid them, because if we had paid them, there would have been some technicality where they could have shut the guys down. Because the police officers know, and they will tell you to your face, that open carry is not illegal in the city of Ferguson, Missouri. So they were scrambling around, searching, dusting off old law books, trying to find some reason to shut the guys down. And the second night, we decided amongst ourselves that the open carriers or uh, the Oath Keepers would carry a smaller pistol, and one guy had a shotgun. They so graciously uh, worked with us to do that. I'm talking about the Oath Keepers, not the police, because we didn't need their permission to do anything. But we said we'd work with you guys and try to work it out when we were talking to the police chief right when we got there the second night. So we walk around after having a conversation with the police chief where he said that basically he has lawyers to interpret the law for him and he didn't want to discuss about, about any law, even though they always use that excuse that um, not knowing the law is no excuse when the Oath Keepers are telling the police officers the law, they don't really want to hear it. It's completely ridiculous and blown out of proportion and once again, finally, I'd like to give a very big thank you from myself and also Joe Biggs to the Oath Keepers who are watching our backs out there. So here is just a small selection of all the things that we experienced in Ferguson, Missouri, from talking to the police chief uh, to talking to various people in the crowd. You can go watch all those videos on YouTube and see it wasn't people running in fear for their lives. It was people who actually came up to us and dialogued with us 
and realize these guys aren't so bad and we're actually not just protecting us, but the community as well. Joe Biggs here with InfoWars.com. Now tonight we're set up out here on West Florissant Avenue in Ferguson, Missouri, yet again, day two. And last night we came out, we had the Oath Keepers with us and woke up this morning and turns out it's one of the, the largest news stories in the country and maybe globally as well. And there's a lot of misunderstanding. So that's what we're here to talk about. Some of the, uh, the misunderstandings of why we're doing this, why we have you guys out here and what it is you stand for, what the organiz uh, organization's all about, just so some people can kind of have that information. So when they watch this video, they can go, okay, that's what's going on. And then have to continue to continuously read these, you know, BS tweets and they just believe lies. So tell us your name and tell us, you know, why you're out here with us. My name is Sam Andrews, and we put together a team of guys to watch Joe Big and Jakari's back uh, while they walked the streets and did their job. Uh, we had some reporters hurt on Sunday night. Two reporters were attacked and put in the hospital. And we've known Joe for a few months. We've known Jakari for a little while, and we just felt like uh, we we wouldn't be comfortable with them out here by themselves and we offered to help and they said okay come on walk with us watch our back but you know today we see this whole story that we hired you guys and then there goes in this whole legal situation as to whether or not that means you're your you know actual security and all this stuff so that was a thing you guys volunteered your help just like you have with a lot of the other uh, small businesses in the area to help keep them safe so they can continue to operate and help contribute to the Ferguson community. Well, we weren't just guarding businesses like a dentist shop and uh, restaurants and Natalie's Cakes and more. We were guarding people in the apartments above those businesses. And that's something the media just doesn't ever seem to mention, which is the truth. We put the majority of our men guarding people that were sleeping at night in buildings that had been attacked and people had attempted to try and burn them out and murder them by arson. And uh, that's something the media just doesn't seem to want to talk about when it's in reference to the Oath Keepers. But the bottom line is we come out here and we find we have an unlawful St. Louis County chief that wants to violate our law, says he doesn't care about 44.101, a Missouri revised statute that says police officers may not confiscate guns from citizens in time of emergency. Let me ask you this. And I'm not doing this as a threat, I'm just asking. No, we're listening. Do you guys got a security license? We don't need one. Yeah, you yeah, actually do. So, that's all if we hire them. It's actually no, it's not. It's that's actually if we're hired. That's how the ordinance Hey, Chief, are you familiar with 44.101? I'm not an attorney. Missouri revised That's statute? why I have attorneys, okay? My attorney, Matt. I, and I'm not arguing with you, okay? No, we're I'm just telling you, I have attorneys. Sure. I didn't go to law school. And this is the problem. We have police leadership. Not the guys on the street doing the job, but we have leadership that doesn't care about our laws. We pay them to enforce our laws, and yet they thumb their nose at our laws and do whatever they want. And we're sick and tired of this kind of criminal behavior from the top cop in St. Louis County. Belmer needs to resign or respect our state laws. And he just refuses to do it. And he thumbs his nose at it with an arrogance that is really remarkable. Now, earlier tonight, we had someone approach kind of seemed upset about the fact that you guys had weapons and then all of a sudden it de-escalated. Why that happen? Well, we talked to him and we said, you know, we care about you and we hope that someday you'll carry a weapon to defend yourself because your life matters. It's just as valuable as ours. And, you know, our dream, our wish is for everybody to be able to defend themselves. If the police had done their job and defended the people of Ferguson, we wouldn't be, be here. But we are here because they didn't do their job and we had to do some of it for them as much as we could. And so many people here don't even realize that they have the right to carry a firearm in the state of Missouri and protect their life, their liberty, and their property. And it's amazing how many people believe if they're seen with a gun that they'll be arrested by St. Louis County Police. I think there ought to be a federal investigation of that phenomenon. <coughs> All right, so there you have it. Once again, we're out here day two on West Florissant Avenue in Ferguson, Missouri. Stay tuned for more reports at InfoWars.com. How are you doing, sir? What's your name? Joe Biggs. We were here last week.
you guys doing? How you doing? Joe Biggs. Ken Cash. Nice to meet you. How you doing, Joe Biggs? Probably saw me on the media talking trash about you. How you doing? What's your name? Sam Andrews. Hi, Sam. You spoke to my lawyer last night. Chief. It's good to see you, buddy. Hey, listen. Um, if you guys are here, obviously, um, and have CCWs, I don't have any problem with that. We all do. My only problem is the long guns and inciting these guys out here. I don't need the headache. I've been doing this for the last year. So I think last November we talked about CCWs are fine. Um, what do you guys, what's your goal here? What's your message? Protect these two men. Because we had a reporter beat up a couple of months ago. I know that. We had a New York paper. Times reporter and a Post Dispatch reporter that was uh, roughed up a few nights ago. Let me ask you this, and I'm not doing this as a threat, I'm just asking. No, we're listening. Do you guys got a security license? We don't need one. Yeah, you actually do. Well, uh, that's all if we hire them. It's actually no, it's not. for hire. I just that's got a legal opinion. Rates. Hey, Chief, are you familiar with 44.101 Missouri Revised? That's statute? why I have attorneys, okay? My attorney, Matt. I, and I'm not arguing with you, okay? No, we're I'm listening. just telling you, I have attorneys. Sure. I didn't go to law school. So you guys may be attorneys, I don't know, okay? But I went. I reached out to the attorney today, and I asked him about this because I needed an opinion on it. Uh, and he said, "Employ doesn't necessarily mean pay. It means employ, like you would employ a tool or like a synonym for the word decoy." That's exactly right. Okay. Well, would you do your favor? Will you ask your attorney to review 44.10? I will. I will. I will continue to ask him to make sure that he looks into this because apparently he's missed that law. And but that was but signed here's, the law here's by my the goal. In okay. I get where you guys are coming from. I get what you stand for. I agree probably with most of it. Okay. But what I can't have here is any sort of a problem to where I have officers out here for several nights. I get kicked in the uh, rear end over this deal. Etc. It just causes headaches. Gentlemen, all I'm trying to do is manage this thing. You, you please need to understand that. No, we well, do. We I'm understand. not going to be trying, I'm not trying to go down here and, and mess but with people. But last night that happened. Okay? Well, no, what we did is we walked around, and that's some of the word on the street was, but if you actually look at a lot of the video, a lot of people came over, we opened up dialogue, we talked about Second Amendment, we talked I about all it. kinds of I stuff. Understand. People came up, hugged these guys, shook their hands, because we have they've a lot seen of their, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you do. Built some rapport with them. And I grew up just north of here, too. So, you know, Costello, Kunji, Ford, the old north of Turner's Gym up here. I mean, I get it. Okay. So, I understand where I am, too. Uh, but more than anything else, uh, this community is going to have to have a chance to get back to where it needs to be, as every community would want that for. And these, well, there is a lot of good people down there. You guys saw them last night, and yeah. what you're saying is true. Yeah. And I just want to be out there for these guys. And I certainly want to be out there for my police officers out here. So, you know, we don't have to uh, just continue this night after night. You guys continue to do exactly what I see you doing right now. I have zero problem with it, okay? What I don't want to have to see is slung exterior weapons. So, again, I'm not, we can debate all we want no, to. No, 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 we toned it down tonight. We toned it down tonight, trying to respect and what and you I, had to say. I appreciate that. I uh, really but, do. Well, we'd like you to respect the state law. If you don't like it, have the legislators change it. Again. I have attorneys, you have attorneys, I can deal with that later, okay? It's an open carry state, our attorney you know. and And the law, when there's an emergency declared, state law prohibits any government official from confiscating firearm or well, ammunition from a citizen. Well, an emergency declared, an executive order has been declared, and there's a difference there, okay? So... There's the not county executive said on the news yesterday. Well, it's an executive order, I have a copy of it. But regardless, you guys are fine right now. Right. I just don't want anything salacious or provocative to, to just churn Certainly. this up any more than it is. Okay? We don't want to do that. We're not here for that. And that's exactly where I am, so that's why I wanted to come over and talk to you guys about we it. We appreciate so you where that. I was, okay? You and I appreciate what you guys have done in service of our country. You well, know that. We thank you for that. Okay? Chief. God bless you guys. And you. Thank you. You'll be safe, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Good seeing you, Sam. You'll be safe, okay? How you doing? And to touch briefly on another topic, Ben Carson, a Republican presidential candidate, has come out and spoken out against Planned Parenthood. Now, I'm not on the Carson bandwagon just for the simple fact that he is pressing mandatory vaccinations, but we'll go out to break with this clip and then come back later in our show with Reverend Clinton Childress, who's going to talk more about the heinous deeds going on at Planned Parenthood. Well, I know who Margaret Sanger is. She believed in eugenics 
and that she was uh, not particularly enamored with black people. And, and one of the reasons that you find most of their uh, clinics in black neighborhoods is uh, so that you can find a way to control that population. And I, th I think people should go back and read about Margaret Sanger, who founded this place, a woman who Hillary Clinton, by the way, says that she admires. Look and see what uh, many people in Nazi Germany thought about her. The FBI has arrested a pair of ISIS wannabes in Mississippi. The newlyweds allegedly claimed via social media they plan to travel to Syria and join ISIS. This follows the arrest of another ISIS wannabe in New Jersey earlier this week. This latest incident follows a now well-established pattern, engaging in online conversations with FBI agents posing as terrorists. In May, declassified defense documents from 2012 revealed the U.S. and its partners in the Gulf states and Turkey supported the Islamic State and planned to establish a Salafist principality in Syria. And in 2011, a report revealed the FBI organizes nearly all terror plots in the U.S. Can the federal government take credit for saving us from a plot of its own creation? The FBI has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. They all have a common and reprehensible thread. They were planned, plotted, controlled, and carried out by the federal government itself. FBI agents and operatives find suspects that could potentially carry out lone wolf attacks and then more or less encourage them to do so, only to bust them before any of the events fully materialize. If you're uh, submitting budget proposals for a law enforcement agency, for an intelligence agency, you're not going to submit the proposal that we won the war on terror and everything's great because the first thing's going to happen is your budget's going to be cut in half. You know, it's my uh, opposite of Jesse Jackson's keep hope alive. This is keep fear alive. Keep it alive. You know, I know who Margaret Sanger is. And uh, I know that she believed in eugenics and that she was uh, not particularly enamored with black people. And, and one of the reasons that you find most of their uh, clinics in black neighborhoods is uh, so that you can find a way to control that population. And I, th I think people should go back and read about Margaret Sanger, who founded this place, a woman who Hillary Clinton, by the way, says that she admires. Look and see what uh, many people in Nazi Germany thought about her. In 1916, H.G. Wells' lover, Margaret Sanger, starts her promotion of eugenics in the United States. In 1923, Sanger receives massive funding from the Rockefeller family. Sanger wrote to fellow eugenicist Clarence J. Gamble that black leaders would need to be recruited to act as front men in sterilization programs directed against black communities. In 1924, Hitler pins Mein Kampf, or my struggle and credits U.S. eugenicist as his inspiration. I admire Margaret Sanger enormously, her courage, her tenacity, her vision. I am really in awe of her. By 1927, eugenics hit the mainstream. The so-called science was aggressively pushed through contests at schools, churches, and at state fairs. Churches competed in contests with big cash prizes to see who could best implement eugenics into their sermons. Major denominations then tell Americans that Jesus is for eugenics. That same year in the United States, more than 25 states passed four sterilization laws and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of brutal sterilization policies. When Hitler came to power in 1933, one of his first acts was to pass national eugenics laws modeled after laws in the United States. The Nazi brand of eugenics had embarrassed the elites, but they had no intention of stopping their plans. The Allies literally fought with each other over who would get top Nazi eugenicist. It didn't matter if the SS doctors had tortured tens of thousands to death, they were free to go. The angel of death, Joseph Mengele, and his boss, Otmar von Verscher, were not prosecuted, and von Verscher even continued his work in Germany after the war. Eugenicists were angry that their great work had been exposed. They then scrambled to camouflage their agenda. 
Eugenics Quarterly became Social Biology. The American Birth Control League became Planned Parenthood. New terms like transhumanism, population control, sustainability, conservation, and environmentalism replaced racial hygiene and social Darwinism. This is Margaret Slee, president of America's Planned Parenthood Federation, maintains that European women should stop having babies for the next 10 years. Don't you think such a theory, such a radical theory, is antisocial? On the contrary, it seems to me that it is more practical and humane. What about the women who want babies now and in 10 years will not be able to have babies? Rather impractical, don't you think? Oh, John, you do ask hard questions. I should think that instead of being impractical, it is really very practical and intelligent and humane. High alert in Britain, as the facade of terror attacks, similar to the ones orchestrated in Boston, supposedly threaten the lives of the royal court. Scotland Yard's Royal Protection Branch and the Home Office have been informed of the plot that includes the Queen and also reportedly includes Prince Charles and possibly the British Prime Minister, David Cameron. The attack will supposedly occur at an event next weekend to commemorate the anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Locations allegedly targeted include the St. Martin's in the Field Church, the Field Marshal Slim statue, and Westminster Abbey. The unsubstantiated threat will result in increased security for the event. Veterans have been told they must provide photographic identification to obtain tickets, according to the Daily Mail, something they've never been asked of before. But is this just another mass psyop, another rollout by the global military industrial complex to prepare the public for future orchestrated attacks? The colluding ties between British intelligence and Islamic extremist leaders reach back before 9-11. In 1996, British intelligence paid Al-Qaeda around $160,000 to fund an assassination plot against Libyan leader Muammar al-Qaddafi. The British press was banned from discussing the case. The New York Times asked, Did the British government try to assassinate Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi, the Libyan leader, in February 1996 by planting a bomb under his motorcade? And did the plan go awry? Because agents from MI6, the Foreign Intelligence Service, put the bomb under the wrong car, killing several Libyan bystanders. Britons may never know the answer. A sweeping injunction has barred newspapers and television news programs from publishing the embarrassing allegations about the inner workings of of Britain's security services, brought up by a disgruntled former officer. The media have been forced to discuss the allegations without actually saying what the allegations are. Abu Hamza al-Masri, the imam presiding over the infamous Finsbury Park Mosque, Hamza began working for British intelligence and police in 1997. He informed on fellow Muslims and was granted favors by MI5, including the release of suspected terrorists. Hamza told his aides he was beyond the reach of British law. In 1999, Hamza would be implicated in the kidnapping and murder of Western tourists in Yemen. He would tell police he was following the Quran and would be released. The police returned to Hamza audio tapes packed with usual messages of intolerance and hatred and culminating in exhortations to kill the enemies of Islam. Harun Rashid Aswat, a top aide to Abu Hamza, would later be singled out as the supposed mastermind of the London 7-7 bombings. Aswat is also suspected of working with British intelligence. Omar Bakri Mohammed, who collaborated with Osama bin Laden, also worked for British intelligence. The British government knows who we are. He said, MI5 has interrogated us many times. I think now we have something called public immunity, Bakri admitted in 2001. Like many jihadists, the Syrian-born imam was connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, a documented British and later CIA intelligence asset. The terrorist who trained the London bombers was a U.S. informant. The London Guardian reports citing his exceptional cooperation in working with U.S. authorities, a New York judge released Mohammed Junaid Babar, despite him pleading guilty to five counts of terrorism. The 10th of December of last year, 
years, six years after his initial arrest and subsequent guilty plea, he was sentenced to time served and charged $500 by the court in a special assessment fee. Other leaders of Islamic extremism protected by the British government in what is now being dubbed Londonistan include Al-Libi, implicated in the alleged Al-Qaeda bombings of two U.S. embassies in Africa. Abu Qatada, the radical imam, told MI5 agency exercised powerful spiritual influence over the Algerian community in London. The cleric sermons were found in a flat in the German city of Hamburg used by some of those involved in 9-11. In May, the British government fast-tracked a proposal to allow police to monitor the conversations of alleged terrorists. We will introduce legislation to combat groups and individuals who reject our values and promote messages of hate, said Home Secretary Theresa May. Since 2000, the government has introduced five major pieces of terrorism legislation, often in response to anticipated events like the supposed plot against the Queen. A theater of fears persisted worldwide, with all of the roles inhabited by government patsies time and time again. In order to pass illegal, liberty-destroying legislation, how is this latest threat any different? In the words of Thomas Jefferson, when government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. John Bound for Infowars.com. Turns out it wasn't just yoga moves on Hillary's server after all. After months of denials and delaying actions, Hillary Clinton has decided to turn over her private email server to the Department of Justice. Well, she really doesn't have much choice. These weren't just ordinary secrets found in Clinton's private server, but some of the most classified material the U.S. government has. In other words, top secret. But what difference at this point does it make, right Hillary? Especially after it's been revealed that Chinese email hackers have been spying on top U.S. figures since 2010, and Clinton's server was completely unencrypted for several months. People found to have willfully mishandled such highly classified information face severe punishment. At minimum, they have their clearances suspended pending the outcome of the investigation. If the Democratic frontrunner, who's now under a criminal FBI probe, has her security clearance Parents revoked, can she even be the president? We've seen the videos about Planned Parenthood come out over the past month. These horrific tales of people wanting to use baby parts to go buy Lamborghinis, of people saying that they want to use hearts and fetuses and sell them like chicken meat. It's completely ridiculous and, in my opinion, illegal. So now we have Reverend Childress of BlackGenocide.org who's going to talk to us about these allegations and about these things that are going on and also what you can do to get involved. And thank you for joining us today, Reverend. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Now, we talked a few weeks ago and we couldn't work out our schedules, but you're here now and I want to get your view on some of these videos we've seen over the past, I guess, month or so now, these Planned Parenthood videos, these hidden camera videos, going back to some of the earlier ones where we heard people talking about Lamborghinis and also uh, bargaining for the prices of baby parts like they were talking about, you know, uh, chicken breast and chicken legs. So when you yeah. first saw those videos, what was your initial reaction? Well, it, I was just thrilled from this point of view that finally they were exposed. These are things that we knew back in 202, 204 that it was going on. And uh, all kudos go to the uh, Center for Medical Progress for a very key uh, sting that unquestionably has caused Planned Parenthood to be up against the ropes at this present time and has quite a bit of explaining to do. But um, even to the point, body parts, okay, but intact fetuses, this is as heinous, as depraved as it gets. And we, the people right now, are at the point of uh, the crossroads of conscience, I would say. We know now this is going on. I don't need to see another five or six videos. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Is this the America that we want? Is this, this uh, an institution like this? Are they to be shielded and not disciplined and not uh, defunded and shut down? This is really quite a cross crossroad for this country right now. And as you're talking about the more videos that are going to be released, I'm in agreement with you. I don't need to see two or three or however many no. more there are. What we've seen to me is already enough, but we do already see the people with the pushback. They're saying that these videos are doc doctored, heavily edited, and to the sense that they edit down like an hour and a half conversation down to five minutes, yes, they're edited. But the question is, are they out of context? And I don't believe so. 
They're throwing out anything they can at this point. You let me tell you something. Cecil Richards knows she's been had. Now the question is, do we do we basically uh, just admit our guilt, which of course they're not going to do, or do we cast every deceptive scheme we possibly can say and demonize the Center for Medical Progress as much as we can? They're going to get help from the White House. They're going to get help from certain senators and congressmen, mm -hmm. as disgraceful as that is. But nevertheless, I think the evidence is too conclusive. I mean, there's nothing more they can say that other than to basically just depict the deceptive cult that they are. But right now, America is on trial. Right now, America is on trial. Um, we are still seemingly in the hands of evil that demands that we uh, sell body parts, whether alive or, or, or well, uh, intact. Um, there's this, it, there's this, this curse on this country to profit from selling a people, selling a bodies, as you know, with, uh, with the hijacking, uh, not hijacking, with, uh, human trafficking, mm -hmm. uh, being as prevalent as it is in this country, selling body parts, uh, mutilating babies. Uh, this, come on, we can turn this around as a people. We can put this dialogue on the front burner. We have a golden opportunity uh, to do that. And right now, we have to step back objectively. Once again, this is not about Democrat or Republican. This is about the soul of this country. And I think, I believe we're going to even have some Democrats that will agree with the Republican push at this present time. And I hope it comes from principle and from morality and not just for political favor, but right now, we all should be in unison. Planned Parenthood has to go. And the argument I've heard, I'm sure you've heard as well, that Planned Parenthood only gives about 3% of their funds and resources towards abortion. And I would contrast with that by saying that 97% of the people who protest, protest in front of Planned Parenthood are out there because of abortion. So if they just knocked out this one thing, yes, there may be other type of issues, but the most vocal people are out there because of abortion. So as we talk more about this in the attempts to defund Planned, Hood, defund Planned Parenthood and the people who are pushing back against this, what would you say to anybody who at this point, after seeing the videos and whatever else may come about, that still contain, still maintain that we should continue to fund Planned Parenthood? Well, well first of all, Medicaid is about 500 million, then 60 or 70 more million dollars federally. Of course, I can do the uh, be the guru of the bookkeeper and present to the country that, oh, we only spend 3% of our funding on abortion. They can spend whatever they want, and that's what they're doing. And if, and if that is the case, why would you have to market body parts? If indeed that this is such a small portion of your business, they're, they're, this is an institution of greed, I would never believe their books or anything that they would doctor to show America. The, the, the fact of the matter is that they are the leading abortion provider in this country. 20% of all abortions are done by Planned Parenthood. They are uh, disproportionately African American. And I say to all who are listening that they unquestionably are a racist organization. And this is now, are they not only racist, but they're calloused and depraved. Um, body parts, uh, $999 for a brain. What was it, 625 for a liver? I mean, the Adolf of the Third Reich didn't do this. I mean, we really must put the brakes on here, stop, take a deep breath, and say, wait a minute, I live in America. We're better than this. We're not going to allow this to continue. And I've heard pro-choice people, people who still have not been enlightened on the heinousness of abortion, become appalled at the fact that the children are, are being dissected and sold. Uh, of course, that's a start for them to head back to the moral base and moral understanding that murder is just murder. And it is unquestionably denying a person the right to the American dream. But and when, when pro-choicers who agree with abortion start saying that that crosses the line, 
we who know the truth should be even more fervent and be more outspoken. Everybody who says they are pro-life has to take this up on another level now. Everybody can do more than what they've been doing. This conversation cannot be controlled by the media. We must force the media. And to show you how divine this is, it, you, you're, you're, this is a presidential race. All of the candidates that we saw in the debate were talking about Planned Parenthood. <laughs> this, when did you ever see a debate, presidential debate leading right. up to 260? I mean, this is, I, I say to all those who love America and love decency and love uh, the, and desire this country's future to shift from the direction it's going in, see that this is a divine act of God. All black life matters. Where do we derive that from? From a mantra they came up with. Black life matters. It's being funded by George Soros. Thank you, Mr. Soros. You begin to plow up the ground for me, and I'm coming in behind you with this message. All black life matters. And of course, we know all life matters, but I have to play in their world and their game that they're playing, and I plan to use that to expose their own hypocrisy. This is a a golden time, and it's all been put together by means which we none of us could have done. And um, the Center for Medical Progress, all black, um, Black Lives Matter. Um, the it's just uh, a special time. Even we were able to utilize the hatred many have in the African American community, especially for the Confederate flag. But you basically honor the Planned Parenthood flag. I mean, there, we have to juxtapose these issues out there and say, I, I, I am not going to overtly protest over a, a flag uh, that represented a past. That's right, Reverend. I, when, now, when Reverend, we, Reverend yes. I hate to cut you off. We have to go to break, but I want you to finish that thought talking about Black Lives Matter. We'll be back again right after this break. Okay, so uh, we've been able to utilize another issue there over the uh, Confederate flag. And basically, I've been saying to all African-Americans, we, we cannot become outraged over the Confederate flag of, of, of seasons ago when you have a present day flag that is killing 1,786 African-Americans a day and has proven historically, empirically, without question, to be racist and to target African Americans, and yet Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, the Congressional Black Caucus, the National Action Committee, NAACP are going to be screaming about the Confederate flag? I, I, I think not. I think uh, these, once again, were issues and uh, newsworthy items that were given to us divinely to carry the message of black genocide. And uh, we know that the shedding of innocent blood pollutes the land. Uh, righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any nation. I honestly believe God is asking the pro-life community and the, and, and the nation at all to deal with this issue of abortion. It's giving the biggest culprit Planned Parenthood and exposing it before the eyes of the country. And God is stepping back to say, okay, what are you going to do now? And I think we're at, once again, the crossroads of conscience. I'm, I'm praying that we respond uh, properly in the fashion in which God can honor our efforts and eradicate this evil from America. And I'm so glad you brought that up. As far as a spiritual perspective, sometimes we run across people and they say, well, you know, it's, it's God's will, it's God's plan. So you're saying at this juncture, you know, maybe God is asking us to get involved at some level. What would you say to anybody who is just content, you know, to go to church and not pay attention to any of these issues? Uh, not enough, especially at this time. And I'm not asking you to do what I do, but there's, there's another level you can take this. Certainly, if you're on social media, you can post up some of those videos by, plan, uh, that by the Center for Medical Progress. You can uh, begin to address your sitting politician, your assembly person, your state senator, your federal uh, senator, and, and really begin to say, this is unnerving. Where do you stand? Isn't it, is, it, it's just wonderful that every candidate uh, whether Democrat or Republican, Republican is going to have to give a clear 
a precise statement on Planned Parenthood. This is historical. This is, since Roe versus Wade, there hasn't been uh, anything of such nature that's going to expose Planned Parenthood and keep it on the front burner of the conversation. This is a critical time. So Christian, uh, human being, <laughs> uh, American citizen, we can do this, all of us together. Uh, get involved with your pastor. Challenge your pastor. Um, and I'm going to be say something that's somewhat radical, but if your pastor's on the wrong side of this, I, I really suggest you, you know, you let him know that you could no longer fellowship at that church because of your conscience. If your pastor is not going to address this, if your spiritual leader is defending Planned Parenthood, it's time to go. And I very rarely make such uh, blatant and broad statements. But that's just the hour we're in right now. And perhaps by you standing up and leaving over this, he or she will come to grips with their own conscience and really begin to uh, objectively look at their relationship with God. God is not going to have me cry over something and then another pastor say, it's okay. Uh, someone's not linked up with the Father, the Holy Spirit, and I believe that <laughs> I am. And I know that uh, we should be weeping between the porch and the altar for over the 60 million babies who have been innocently killed in this country. And I believe now is just an awesome opportunity to do something about that. That's right. Now, as far as the history of Planned Parenthood, can you, with the time we have, talk about Margaret Sanger and why especially black people should be concerned about these facilities and their communities? Well, her ideology was less people of color and less African Americans would do the country and the world better. Uh, that idea, ideology is still present today. Uh, you have to remember, this is the group that tutored the Third Reich. The Third Reich did not tutor America. The American eugenist, uh, Lothrop Stoddard, uh, uh, and, and, and many others uh, whose na names, Francis Galton, uh, well, those who followed him, um, and, and of course, Margaret Sanger, were tutoring uh, Eugene Fisher, who was running the eugenics program for uh, Adolf Hitler. And they, they wrote both sides. I mean, not only uh, did the Third Reich write, but uh, of course, the eugenists in, throughout the world uh, who had the same ideology wrote in the Birth Control League. And always remember, folks, Planned Parenthood wasn't called Planned Parenthood. It was first called the Birth Control League. But after 1945, when you, uh, the word eugenics was a dirty word, they changed the name to Planned Parenthood. Nobody got fired. <laughs> Nobody left. All the ties were still remained the same. They still had the same ideology, and their target was still people of color. So, uh, and she said, and this has been a masterful strategy that has worked. Why? Because I'm looking at it and living in it each day. She said, we need to hire three or four colored ministers who basically could be the face of our program so that the African-American community would not become alarmed. And that's Margaret Marcus, Sanger? Yes, yes. Margaret Sanger said, the way to approach the Negro is through the religious approach. Um, I really want to talk to Republicans about that, but nevertheless, <laughs> that's something that's a program at the time. But this is what she did. And so she paid them to preach these family planning messages when all along she was trying to induce or introduce sterilization and abortion to be the means for uh, contraceptive, knowing it would hurt them physically also. So what you have today, you have Jesse Jackson, who was once pro-life, he flipped. Um, you have uh, Al Sharpton, Kojic minister, believe it or not, whose mission statement is against abortion. If you're a Kojic minister, he's ignored that, and he has uh, supported Planned Parenthood. You have the NAACP supporting Planned Parenthood, even coming out in 2004 saying that they were pro-choice. Now, they retracted that, but the agenda remained the same. Uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, Robin Kelly, a congresswoman, I think, from Illinois or Michigan, somewhere around in there, who uh, partnered with Planned Parenthood to have a, a uh, seminar with the Congressional Black Caucus to do what? 
to get Planned Parenthood more into the African-American neighborhood. I mean, once again, the statistics are horrific. 52% of all African-American pregnancies uh, end in abortion, 1,786 a day. And these are not my statistics. These are statistics from the Center for Disease Control, from the U.S. Census, and, of course, the research arm of Planned Parenthood, who they claim that they're not. That's an absolute lie. Alan Guttmacher, who was at one time the president of Planned Parenthood. So the racism is deep. The eugenics ideology is still there. They want to socially engineer. It is why they live and breathe. And then there's those who do it for the money, you know, a Lamborghini. Um, and I had often said if abortion was not lucrative, it would not be legal. That's right. Now, Reverend Childrich, with about the minute we have left, tell people how they can keep up with your work and also anything they can do or any final thoughts you may have for them. I appreciate, as I stated, as you said, what should we be doing? Everybody, take it up another level in your conversation. Uh, if you're looking for things to talk about, see my Alpha 21, Mark Crutcher, Life Dynamics. I'm working with Greg Cunningham, Center for Bioethical Reform. Go to our website, blackgenocide.org. You can also go to abortionno.org. And uh, soon, you could probably go there now, but I haven't finished with it. Give me another week or so. Allblacklifematters.com. And we're going to uh, historically uh, keep you up to date on every um, project we do with an analysis. And it has been just awesome. It has had an awesome time at Fayetteville. That's an all-black college. Awesome time at the NAACP convention for three days in the streets of Philadelphia, engaging NAACP uh, delegates with all Black Lives Matters. Well, I can't wait to hear more about that, Reverend Childress, another time. <laughs> okay. And we'll have you back on. And I d definitely encourage everybody to go check out your sites. Thank you so much, Reverend. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Thank you. That's it for our show. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.